Sports. Well, before last night's debate, we learned that about 40% didn't even know the names of the vice presidential candidates. We had 41% didn't know who Governor Pence was, and 46% didn't know who Tim Kaine was. I don't know that changed very much because we see today that it was the least watched vice presidential debate since the year 2000. They said about 36 million people watched. What did they see? Well, we cut a lot of reports as this is going out. There were a lot of amazing things that came out of the debate last night. We had Governor uh, or Senator Kane, and of course, uh, he's a former governor, saying that uh, Donald Trump had said that Social Security was a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, it's a classic Ponzi scheme. You need to understand what's involved with Social Security. A lot of very interesting things. But one of the reports that we had, we talked about how Kane said that Hillary Clinton was a strong leader. She had gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies. And as I pointed out, yeah, she didn't do too well, did she, for us. She did pretty good for herself for the Clinton Foundation. They got massive amounts of money when they gave Putin 20% of the United States uranium control of that. And that's what we see over and over again. They try to make Putin a demon, and yet we see that they get their hands held, handed to them every time they try to uh, interact with him. The key thing, though, is that they restarted the Cold War. And as I thought about that phrase, toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Russians, it really reminded me of the previous Cold War that we had that was really characterized by Dr. Strangelove. I want to play a clip for you that really shows, what, if you don't know Dr. Strangelove, this is how you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies. Hillary Clinton has gone toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Hillary Clinton has gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russia. Well, boys, I reckon this is it. Nuclear combat toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies. She went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russia as Secretary of State. I got a pretty fair idea that something doggone important is going on back there. She went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russia and lodged protests when they went into Georgia. And we've done the same thing about Ukraine, but more than lodging protests, we've put punishing economic sanctions on Russia. That I have to stop this because the scumbags at Google controlled YouTube decided to flag this video because they don't want you to see it. They don't want you to see the parody. They don't want you to see real news. We need to continue. Target in sight. Brian Hallis, Major Kong. Hey, what about Major Kong? You see, they don't want you to see this because right now we have a real life Dr. Strange love. Well, boys, I reckon this is it. Nuclear combat toe to toe with the Ruskies. You notice that Tim Kaine is really happy about the fact that we've restarted the Cold War in Crimea. We've got sanctions which, in and of themselves, are really an act of war. We've had General Betraeus in the last week saying it's not too late for us to declare a no-fly zone and to just shoot down Russian planes over Syria. Understand, it's the Syrian government that invited the Russians there to help them fight ISIS. ISIS, our proxy, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, our proxy to overthrow the Syrian government. And of course, Hillary Clinton was a big part of the creation of ISIS with what she did in Libya. But you know, as we look at this, and he repeats this, Three times this phrase going toe to toe with the Ruskies. I thought, you know, is this a Freudian slip or is he really channeling Dr. Strangelove? I'm not I'm not really so sure. It seems that they are rechanneling this whole mad mindset, mad in the sense of insane, mad in the sense of mutual assured destruction. And it's not just Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine. Take a look at this general, what he had to say yesterday. We'll stop you and we will beat you harder than you've ever been beaten before. Make no mistake about that. Other countries, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea went to school on us. They closely watched how we fought in 91 and 03. They studied our doctrine, our tactics, our equipment, our organization, our training, and our leadership. And in turn, they revised their own doctrines and they are rapidly modernizing the military today to avoid our strengths in hopes of defeating us at some point in the future. Now that was Army Chief of Staff General Mark Milley. And when I looked at that, I couldn't help but recall George C. Scott again in that same movie, Dr. Strangelove, which was a perfect black comedy showing the insanity 
of the Cold War that we have now restarted. Here's General George C. Scott doing, uh, about uh, 50 years ago, doing General Mark Milley. The rest of the talks have been, but frankly, we think he's short of know how. I mean, you just can't expect a bunch of ignorant peons to understand a machine like some of our boys. And that's not meant as an insult, Mr. Ambassador. I mean, you, you take your average rusty, we all know how much guts he's got. Hell, look at, look at all of them Nazis killed off, and they still wouldn't quit. Can't you stick to the point, General? Google-owned YouTube doesn't want you to see this. They flagged this video, so I have to stop it. But here we go again. Well, uh, sir, uh, if the pilot's good, see, I mean, I mean he's really sharp. He can barrel that baby in solo. I mean, <laughs> you ought to see it sometime. It's inside you. A big plane, like a 52. It's dead exhaust. Frying chickens in the barn. <laughs> now, we might laugh at that, but, you know, this really isn't a laughing matter. The Cold War was not a laughing matter. I remember as a child, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was in Florida at the time. And we were told, even though the school was just uh, uh, maybe about a half a mile from where I lived, we were told we wouldn't have time to get home. We'd have to bring clothes to school. They gave us duck and cover drills. You know, if uh, a nuclear bomb happens, just duck down and cover. You can stick your head in the metal desk, they told us. And even though I was in elementary school, I thought, you know, what is that for? Is that so they can identify what's left of my dental records, perhaps, if it's inside of a metal, metal desk? That's the insanity, the mutual assured destruction that now we see being revived by the Democrats as well as Republicans. The Russians understand how serious this is. During the first Cold War, the bomb shelters that were being sold to Americans, created by Americans, that was something that individuals are doing. We never had any civil defense drills here in the United States, unlike in Russia and other countries. And they are getting very serious about it as well. They take these threats very seriously, and they should. We see that Russia is holding a massive nuclear war exercise. This came out last couple of days involving 40 million people. And this is as a direct result of the revival of the Cold War and all of this tough talk that I think is really very serious when you look at what, how what's happened in the Ukraine, in Crimea. If you look at the tough talk about shooting down Russian planes over Syria, as we act as Al-Qaeda and ISIS's Air Force. It was the Americans who broke the ceasefire. It was the Americans who attacked a Syrian base that had been long been a Syrian base, turning it over to ISIS. That was the initial breaking of the ceasefire. Now it is done. And as we look at this massive uh, uh, exercise, a uh, civil defense exercise, 200,000 emergency services personnel and soldiers as part of this 40 million people here, 50,000 pieces of equipment during a massive civil defense exercise. So they take that seriously. And yet, remember when uh, we had Mark Dice back in uh, 2015, June of 2015, a little over a year ago, talking to people in one of his uh, reports in California and saying, you know, Obama would like for you to sign this petition so that we can nuke the Russians. He said, we just need a couple more signatures to support President Obama's new plan to deal with Russia. We're going to launch a preemptive pre nuclear strike, and we'd like for you to uh, sign this petition to encourage Obama to do that. He says, this is the only way that we can maintain our superiority, he tells the people as they're signing the petition. He says, you know how Russia has been threatening the U.S. lately? And he tells us to a guy, and the guy says, yeah. And the guy says, I've been American all my life. Okay, <laughs> This is the insanity, folks. This is the insanity. We don't take how dangerous what Hillary Clinton and the Democrats are doing, and quite frankly, a lot of Republicans are in on this as well. The only person who is pushing back against this and saying, can't we talk to the other side and try to de-escalate that? We used to call that detente, an easing of tensions. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a rational thing? Is that erratic behavior? No, erratic behavior is what we saw with these characters from Dr. Strangelove. Erratic behavior is what we're seeing from Hillary Clinton and from Tim Kaine and from the top Senate Democrat of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. This is uh, Ben Cardin. He is from Maryland, and he ripped Russia today in a speech saying the U.S. must revisit its approach to the Cold War rival. You don't think that I'm serious about this? Look at this from Politico. He says, uh, Russia clearly has no interest in counterterrorism, cooperation, humanitarian relief, or political progress in Syria. He said, Vladimir Putin's Russia is not a partner for peace. And the Obama administration announced on Monday that it was suspending its bilateral negotiations with Russia over a Syrian ceasefire. I would say that they probably decided to suspend that 
when they decimated the Syrian base on behalf of ISIS. He says in apparent retaliation, Putin has now announced that Russia was scrapping a 16-year-old nuclear non-proliferation agreement with U.S. involving destroying plutonium stockpiles. And on Wednesday, Russia said it was suspending an agreement with the U.S. to cooperate on nuclear and energy research. Now, Cardin went on to say that this was largely, he's long been advocating punishing Russia over things like hacking. And he says one option is likely to impose uh, economic sanctions on Russia over its assistance to Assad in Syria. Because, of course, they're there fighting ISIS and we can't have that. Now, understand that this is over things like hacking. Remember Hillary? Listen to what she had to say about what she would do, what it would require for her to go to war. You've seen reports. Russia's hacked into a lot of things. China's hacked into a lot of things. Russia even hacked into the Democratic National Committee. Maybe even some state election systems. As president, I will make it clear that the United States will treat cyber attacks just like any other attack. We will be ready with serious political, economic, and military response. Isn't that chilling? She says that cyber attacks are going to be treated like a physical attack, like any other attack, she said. And she said, we are going to be ready with serious political, economic, and military responses. Now, when you look at this, is she going to go to war because somebody hacked her emails? We've already seen the Bushes go to war in Iraq because Saddam Hussein threatened his father. Took it personally, you know, because that's the way these people are, these gangsters who are running our country. But that is the insanity that we're looking at. The fact that a cyber attack would be used as a basis for a full-on military attack, a war with Russia. Understand that it is not simply... As we look at the uh, Democrats constantly saying it's the Russians who are hacking us, the Russians who are hacking us, we need to step up sanctions, we need to be ready to go to war against them. Understand, that's not really the case. Today, the New York Times, and talking about perhaps a second Snowden, said an NSA contractor has been arrested in a possible new theft of secrets. The FBI secretly arrested a national security contractor in recent weeks and is investigating whether he stole and disclosed highly classified computer codes developed to hack into the networks of foreign governments. Now, besides the fact that this embarrasses the NSA, remember it was just a few weeks ago that we saw on some dark parts of the web an auction of software that was being used to hack into, that the NSA used to hack other code. In other words, the NSA's hacking code was hacked. How do we know when we see these hacks who is behind them? Are we going to launch a nuclear war? At least... During the Cold War, the thing that was going to trigger a nuclear war or response from us was an actual attack, physical attack. And they did everything they could to keep that from happening on a hair trigger. And now we have somebody like Hillary Clinton, someone who Julian Assange says, we don't know about Donald Trump, but we do know that Hillary Clinton hates free speech. And she's one of the worst warmongers we have ever seen. And we've seen her set the Middle East on fire, and we could see her start a third world war. She becomes president. They say this is not only an embarrassing prospect because it's the second time that this has happened, but they go on to say during the FBI raid of his house, agents seized documents and digital information stored on electronic devices. Hmm, that's interesting. Interesting parallels there, isn't it? A large percentage of the materials found in his house and car contained highly classified information. Unlike Hillary, I guess. Do you think she, that he had anything that was more classified than Hillary Clinton's documents? And remember, we learned just last Friday that Cheryl Mills and other close assistants of Hillary Clinton had been given immunity by the FBI so that they could get access to their computer. And at that point, many of us said, why would they have to give them immunity so they could have access to their computer? The FBI would simply take it. And here we see this happening. That's the way the FBI operates with everybody else. And yet... With people that are connected to Hillary Clinton, they find an excuse to give them immunity because they do not want to expose the person who is behind all this. They go on to say that initially he denied having taken the documents and the digital files, kind of like Hillary Clinton, isn't it? The agency later said that he stated that he knew he was not authorized to have the materials, but he didn't think that they were classified. He denied that they were classified initially, just like Hillary Clinton. And his lawyers said uh, he loves his family and his country. There is no evidence that he intended to betray his country. So he didn't have any criminal intent. So the FBI 
ought to let him off just like they let off Hillary Clinton because they said yeah, she didn't really have any intent to do any harm, even though she released thousands of documents that were some of the most highly classified levels you can have beyond top secret, above top secret, endangering people's lives. No, it was Hillary Clinton. She is given a pass. They go on to say that Mr. Martin, the uh, individual that was arrested, is suspected of taking highly classified source code developed by the agency to break into computer systems of adversaries like Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. Think about that. The NSA is already doing what Hillary Clinton says she will consider to be an act of war and will retaliate not only with political and economic sanctions, but with military strikes. And yet, our government is already doing that to the countries that we are threatening with war if we say that they did it to us. And we don't even know for sure if it would be an attack from them when the uh, hacks occur. I, I guess what we have going on here is a kind of rewriting of the golden rule. Instead of do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. So I guess we could call it the Hillary Warmonger rule. Do unto others whatever you wish, but if they do it to you, it'll be war. Now stay with us right after the break. Leanne McAdoo is going to be back, and she's going to talk about the ever-expanding surveillance state. You think it stopped with the USA Freedom Act? And with the Snowden revelations? No, it just keeps growing. We'll be right back. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Wednesday, October the 5th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, wars and rumors of war. Tim Kaine says Hillary is willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Russians. Clinton has gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russia. And she's not afraid to take military action. We will be ready with serious political, economic, and military response. Well, boys, I reckon this is it. Nuclear combat toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies. Meanwhile, a top Senate Democrat says Russia must face the consequences for its actions in Syria. And that means a new Cold War. Russia responds to the threat by holding a massive nuclear war exercise involving 40 million people as military tensions rise between Russia and the United States. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. So remember when the NSA's mass surveillance program was first revealed, Obama came out and said, now, now, relax, everybody. It's not like the spy agency is rifling through the emails of ordinary Americans. Well, of course, now we know that that was a lie. As recently as last year, 2015, Yahoo was secretly building a custom software program to search all of its customers' incoming emails. This is according to three former employees and a fourth person who was briefed on the events. They spoke exclusively to Reuters. They say the company complied with a classified U.S. government demand, scanning hundreds of millions of Yahoo Mail accounts at the behest of the NSA or the FBI. So some surveillance experts are actually saying that this represents the first case to surface of a U.S. Internet company agreeing to an intelligence agency's request by searching all arriving emails as opposed to just examining stored messages or scanning a small number of accounts in real time. Now, Google and Microsoft sep separately said on Tuesday that they had not conducted such email searches. They hadn't done any type of cooperation. But come on, without the cooperation of American companies, both voluntary and compelled, the entire national security agency's surveillance program would have been completely impossible and we've already seen those slides leaked by edward snowden they showed the nsa had an x key score program uh, this program swept up countless people's internet searches their emails documents usernames and passwords and all other private communications and the key score is fed a constant flow of internet traffic from fiber optic cables Ooh, can't wait to get signed up for that Google Fiber, can you? So, and this is in addition to the fact that the CIA spent 10 years hacking iPhones and iPads. They bragged about planting backdoors and keystroke loggers. We know that they plan to infect Samsung and Google apps, uh, the, infect the app store with spyware. And after a 2010 hack of Google and some 20 other large U.S. companies, allegedly by the Chinese government, Google was forced to embrace a collaboration with the NSA. 
Now, the Washington Post reported on this at the time, saying that this agreement would not allow the NSA to access users' search details or emails. Mm, right. And, of course, we, we've been reporting as recently as far back as 2006 that Google was actually given some startup money by the CIA. So we know they're a CIA front company, um, and, of course, they sell a lot of products to the CIA and other government agencies. They're actually manufacturing all the software that these spy agencies use, so I'm sure that they have no problem sharing intelligence. And who knows what they're up to now, because an alleged second Snowden was just arrested for stealing highly classified source codes developed by the NSA to hack into foreign governments. So isn't it ironic how Hillary Clinton just came out and said, if I'm elected president, I have no problem going to war with Russia or China over cyber attacks, when here, once again, it is the NSA and the U.S. government that is actually creating this software with the intention of hacking into foreign governments like Russia and China. And then Hillary Clinton comes out and declares that she is going to take military action against these foreign governments for doing the type of work that the U.S empire is up to itself you've seen reports russia's hacked into a lot of things china's hacked into a lot of things russia even hacked into the democratic national committee maybe even some state election systems as president i will make it clear that the united states will treat cyber attacks just like any other attack we will be ready with serious political economic and military response so this basically sums up Hillary Clinton's plans for the presidency. Let's not forget, according to inside sources there at the State Department, she actually pondered the idea of using a drone to take out Julian Assange. This was um, citing anonymous sources there. They said she was under intense pressure to silence WikiLeaks. She actually was proposing non-legal means to take out her enemies. So here we go. This is Hillary Clinton's America. And if, of course, that happens, we are all in a world of trouble. Leanne Mackett reporting for Infowars.com. Recently, United Nations Peace Day was celebrated in Austin, Texas. That's right. United Nations Peace Day, a celebration of complete hypocrisy. It is so critically important that we join United Nations effort begun in 1981 to declare this day the day of peace and to recognize and celebrate the 11 days of global unity beginning on September 11th and whereas the International Day of Peace challenges all people, all people of the world to consider what it means to be human and to rededicate themselves to our shared humanity now, therefore, I, Steve Adler, Mayor of the City of Austin, Texas, do hereby proclaim September 21st of the year 2016 as Peace Day in Austin, Texas. The same United Nations fomenting the growing possibility of World War III as Russia is demonized rather than met with diplomacy simply because they will not bend to the will of globalism. Bilateral relations have taken a turn for the worse for the U.S. and Russia. Moscow has suspended an agreement on the disposal of surplus weapons-grade plutonium. The Kremlin said unfriendly acts by the U.S. towards the Russian Federation pushed President Vladimir Putin to sign a decree halting the agreement, which came into force in 2010. In the face of none of these atrocities, has Russia expressed outrage? Nor has it demanded investigations, nor has it ever called for a Saturday night emergency consultation in the Security Council? And a year ago, at the UN General Assembly, Russia decided to join the Assad regime, escalating the conflict, and perhaps worst of all, itself adopting some of the regime's worst practices. That's all to confuse the public that we, our government, gave a bunch of weapons in Syria, in Libya, a bunch of other places, to Al-Qaeda to make those countries be failed states. Our governments collectively put them there. That's the big enchilada. That's the 20 trillion pound elephant in the room. 
That's the dead dog, you know, under the floorboards that's stinking the house up. This is the issue. And if the governments of the world can get away with this, they can pretty much say two plus two equals 100. You know, the same United Nations with peacekeeper forces that routinely rape the children they are there to protect. It's doing everything we possibly can to assist the victims, to bring accountability and justice for them. The same United Nations that is on the verge of crossing the threshold on the ratification of the Paris Climate Pact, which under UN Agenda 2030 will tax every human activity and force humanity into densely packed megacities under UN control. The same United Nations gradually taking control of your local police force under the Strong Cities Network to establish a global New World Order police state. The same United Nations that wants to replace the natural world with a genetically modified one. Yeah, that United Nations. Oddly enough, the host of this hypothetical UN Peace Day was clueless of the United Nations Agenda 2030. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with 2030. If you weren't aware of it already, Agenda 2030 is a ramp up of the totalitarian Agenda 21, intended to accelerate the New World Order system with major changes beginning in 2018. Meanwhile, populism is sweeping the planet and the anxiety festering amongst the globalists is rising. A Bloomberg chart documents the usage in terms like uncertainty, fear, risk, worry, destabilize, and tensions, among others, from the meeting of the UN Agenda 2015 Assembly until the latest UN Agenda 2016 Assembly. And it's as blatantly obvious as the UN Agenda's supposed peace day, which appears inviting on the surface. But anyone taking the time to read Agenda 2030 will quickly come to the conclusion that the United Nations is nothing less than an arm of the globalists creating a new world order hell on earth. John Bound for Infowars.com. Well, we know that Hillary Clinton likes to script things, script speeches, interviews. She even wears that little earpiece to make sure that everything that she's saying is on target, on cue. You know, Owen, it's really hard to remember uh, lies. It's really easy to remember the truth. And this piece coming out, this leaked memo, it shows that Clinton uh, was given the questions to an interview, a softball interview, as you would say, to borrow your term, uh, from Steve Harvey, this interview that happened in February. And the shocking part of this, reading this, the Free Beacon has published it, it's that she fakes a surprise throughout the interview. Oh boy, oh my goodness, exclaiming at photos. You know, tends to, you know, hap, pretends to be shocked when they talk about Flint water and the crisis there. And she really doesn't do a very good job of faking emotion. Um, it's something that she's had a, a problem with in the past. Even with her Zach Galifianakis interview, it was so dull and so mundane. The woman couldn't fake emotion to, to save her life. And we're seeing this again. Does this shock you at all that, of course, even in softball interviews, the woman has to have everything pre-planned. Well, this doesn't shock me. This probably happens a lot whenever candidates go on these shows. They like to know what they're going to be asked. But more than anything, to me, this illustrates the type of candidate Hillary Clinton is. This is a totally controlled candidate. This is a totally scripted candidate. They can't have anything that they don't already know is going to be out there. They can't say anything. They can't be asked anything that they don't already expect. We see this when she does press conferences, whether mm -hmm. she does it on an airplane, uh, whether she does it after an event. They seem to be very controlled, very directed questions that Hillary Clinton is all already expecting. I don't know if she's expecting them to be rolled on an orange, maybe an apple, but this yeah. is the type of stuff that we see from Hillary. So again, I think that this illustrates it. And then you talked about how she was faking mm -hmm. surprise. They went over this script. We already knew that they went over the script. They admitted they went over the script. And then Hillary Clinton acts shocked and surprised when she sees herself as a 12 year old. Maybe she did forget that picture was coming up. She has had, um, you know, some some mental impairment issues during this campaign cycle. So maybe she genuinely uh, was surprised by this. But this is just it, it shows how soft she is. It shows how controlled she is. And I thought Donald Trump was the reality TV candidate. Mm -hmm. Why does Hillary Clinton get to go on these shows and not be bashed for doing it like Donald Trump? It's no <laughs> surprise there. You know, that's, that's an excellent point. So, but we all know that uh, reality TV is scripted and she would be an excellent, excellent actor in reality television, although her, her emotive skills are, are lacking here. We're talking about an interview that had to do with the Flint water crisis. People that didn't have even drinkable water couldn't bathe their own kids. So it looks like she would want some more off the cuff.
questions, but her emotions were nonetheless, they, they seem to always not hit the target. They seem to be off in some cases. And speaking of things that she can't control, uh, she had a press conference in Harrisburg, and she can't control her shaking. Now, this is up on InfoWars, uh, questions regarding why her head is shaking so much. She didn't shake in the Steve Harvey interview, but she's shaking in this conference, and, uh, you know, questions still remaining about her health. She doesn't seem to want to answer anything that people really want to know about. Like, we could care less about the fake, you know, bills the woman's trying to pass or the gun control that she's been trying to push down your throats for the past 25 years. But this, you know, we've got to have an, an all-out push to lie to the American people and say that this is nothing when clearly, clearly it's something. Well, it is strange how they want to kind of avoid the talk of Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. We saw Michael Savage get dropped off the airwaves when he starts bringing You can't up. even question it without being fired. Right, right. So there's an interesting thing there. And we've seen multiple videos where her head's shaking or she's staring awkwardly at balloons mm -hmm. or during interviews she goes into seizures. I mean, for God's sake, she was drugged from the 9-11 memorial like a wet noodle. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is a video to me, I'm not really sure if we can get much from it. Her head is kind of shaking a little awkwardly. I think maybe she's just pretending to be engaged with the person who she's talking to. Mm -hmm. But she is trained. That's one thing we do know. Mm -hmm. She is trained whenever she goes into these kind of uh, loss of control moments of her head or her body to kind of try to smile or laugh it off or Fake shake laugh. her head. Fake yeah, smile. So, so Fake she, understand. She has been trained on this. Maybe that's what we're seeing in this video. Maybe it's not. But at this point, I mean, really, we need this video. We already know Hillary is in terrible health. Uh, there's no question about that to me. Whether this video proves anything or not, um, you can have that debate. But um, just more weirdness, really, of Hillary Clinton's actions during this campaign cycle. Do you think that there's ever going to be a time where there's a correct diagnosis done, either by a, you know, a clinical physician on the air that isn't then threatened, bullied, or fired, in which we could have an accurate diagnosis prior to the, you know, we're 33, 34 days out and no news on this yet. Meanwhile, we've got these fake interviews with fake answers and fake questions and no real That's it's, it's frustrating. I know it's frustrating to you too, but as reporters, you're like, is there ever going to be a day where we actually have something substantive come out of her that, that's actually true? You know what? I think that I have an answer for you, actually. <laughs> I think that the first honest health evaluation we'll get of Hillary Clinton is the day that she is going to jail. The day we put that woman in prison, she's going to have to undergo the physical to get into the prison facility. That's when we're going to get the first honest medical report of Hillary Clinton. When Trump gets in and we send this witch to jail, she won't have any of these fake doctors giving her fake screenings and fake tests and fake test results. We're going to have to know what health you're in when we send you to jail, Hillary. You know, I mean, there is that. So maybe we'll get a diagnosis when she's forced to. Speaking of things that um, really irk us here at Info Wars, and, and this, this has come out, and it's uh, Paul Joseph Watson. He wrote this article. He's actually talking about it today with Alex. Uh, things that could have gotten her in jail, you know, if this had been you or I doing this, uh, this article coming out, Hillary Clinton personally nixed a peace deal in Libya that would have led to free elections for the Libyan people and prevented the country from being seized by ISIS, all because she disliked Gaddafi. She had this personal personal vendetta against Gaddafi and according to this this new whistleblower uh, you know who personally oversaw the negotiations there uh, he actually indicated that she specifically stood in the way of, of Gaddafi uh, you know having these free elections of, of having you know an open and free society she would rather have seen Libya descend into hell and chaos rather than reach across the aisle diplomatically diplomatically which was her entire job and you know as, as secretary of state you're the chief diplomat of this country you know you're you're the foreign policy director yes but at the same time that this is your job and it really it, it indicates what type of personality we're dealing with here very hostile aggressive uh, bitter she she seems to be bitter but something like this comes out and you're looking at it you're like wait a second so how many people died how many people are still dying because of your personality? You know, things like this is what Steve Harvey should have been asking her about, not her stupid policies on, you know, whose gun she wants to take. Well, she would have never gone on Steve Harvey if those were the type of questions that they were going to be asking, uh, obviously. But I think you touched on a couple things that are very important here. This is the type of people we're dealing with with the Clintons. Bill Clinton bombed nations to distract from the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Mm -hmm. These are people that will take their personal vendettas 
to an international, uh, you know, government humanitarian level on a very wide reaching, dangerous, for money. violent responses for money, for distractions, for vendettas, whatever it is. These are very psychopathic people. To me, honestly, I think Bill Clinton is, is, has run his course and he's kind of regretting it. And that's why we're seeing some of this cryptic uh, behavior from Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. But, you know, another thing you mentioned, I'm not sure if this is really Hillary Clinton who's doing this for Hillary Clinton's benefits. I think Hillary Clinton goes in and takes out Gaddafi because what the one world government, central banks, uh, centralized corporations, energy corporations that run this planet really want is a one world government. And when they see Gaddafi propping up the nation of Libya, propping up its people and wanting to build wealth independently as a nation state Using in the Libya. the gold standard as opposed to getting, getting off of the spectrum of how we trade, he wanted to specifically implement the gold standard. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you're absolutely but this right. Is, but this is why Hillary Clinton comes in. This is, the, this is how Hillary Clinton is essentially a mercenary politician working for the bankers, mm -hmm. working for the one world government. So, you know, but, but maybe she maybe she genuinely gets but, off to this. I mean, she might enjoy it. I mean, she did say we came, we saw he died celebrating the death of Gaddafi. Bizarre, the, the cackling, the happiness of taking out Gaddafi and then subsequently sacrificing four Americans because of it. You know, I, I firmly believe that if the woman had just, you know, had to halfway done her job, these four people would still be living and breathing, walking around today. But perhaps they were traded in some sick way. Who knows? Well, the, you wonder if, a, you wonder if she even wanted them alive. Honestly. Seriously. Yeah. Going back to Gaddafi for a second, we know that Wesley Clark, former presidential candidate in 2007, he said, look, and this was prior to Clinton ever assuming, you know, her leadership position with the State Department. But he said, we've got this list of countries that we want to bump off. We want to control. We want to topple. Iraq was on it. Syria was on it. Libya was on it. It finishes off with Iran, by the way. Somalia is also on it. So they're just going down the list though, and checking it off. And these are the countries that do not have have central banks. They want to bring in the central bank. That's what it is, Margaret. That's what it's all about. There's always a bottom line, isn't there? Well, thank you so much for joining us. For more reports like this, be sure and check us out at Infowars.com. Well, gun sales have hit the 17th straight monthly record, up 27%. Now, of course, they get these figures from the FBI's National Instant Criminal Background Check System. You didn't think they were checking backgrounds, you say, if you're for gun control. That's what you keep hearing from the Democrats. No, they're checking background as they sell this through retail outlets. We'll talk about what they do at gun shows in a moment. But think about this. This is, of course, the, uh, the gun salesman-in-chief, Barack Obama. People are buying guns while they can. If Hillary Clinton becomes president, uh, people are concerned about what's going to happen with that. And at the same time... This year, we have had four states go to permitless carry. Understand, that's what we many of us call constitutional carry, because it is a right, not a privilege, to be able to carry firearms to do self-protection. As the New American points out, uh, Missouri, three weeks ago, became the fourth state this year to allow permitless concealed carry of firearms by citizens. They joined West Virginia, Mississippi, and Idaho this year and allowing citizens to enjoy the rights that are enshrined in the Second Amendment. Not given to us by the Second Amendment, but recognized and enshrined in the Second Amendment as a prohibition to government taking them away. They're natural rights that we get as human beings. This brings the total of states that recognize constitutional carry to 12. States that focus on freedom, as they point out, realize that if self-defense is a natural-born right, and the Second Amendment truly affirms that natural-born right, you shouldn't have to ask the government for permission to exercise that right. It's kind of like you don't have to ask the government to exercise the First Amendment right of free speech. Well, not yet anyway. We'll probably see that happen, especially if Hillary becomes uh, president. We'll probably see them coming after that licensing journalist telling you that you have to get permission to speak on the Internet or assigning everybody a number so that if they don't like your speech, they can identify you and shut it down. But take a look at what's happening in California. California is going in the opposite direction, of course. We've already had the California legislature enact a number of gun control measures earlier this year. And they have measures on the ballot in November that will extend those gun regulations. And look what they're doing at gun shows, because that's where there are no background checks if it is a person-to-person -person sale. Of course, there are background checks if you're buying from a vendor. They do the uh, background checks just like a... Uh, uh, a retailer would if they have a storefront. So that's another thing that uh, they don't tell you on the uh, gun control side. There are background checks being done at the gun show, but not enough. There's always a possibility 
that one individual could sell their gun to another individual and the government not know about it. So what are they doing about that? Well, we got federal agents that are driving by and collecting license plates of everybody that's there. Dragnet surveillance. What's behind that? Well, the Wall Street Journal takes a look at that and they say um, it's immigration and customs officers, for one, in California. They drew up this plan back in 2010. We reported on it back then, and we've reported on it subsequently. They say uh, devices that record the plate numbers of all passing cars at gun shows in Southern California. They say, of course, this uh, concerns privacy and gun rights advocates. You know, even the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, which doesn't generally support the Second Amendment, are concerned about this because it's another aspect of dragnet surveillance. And it was last year, even though this plan came out in 2010, it was last year that, again, the Wall Street Journal uh, reported that the DEA was doing this type of surveillance at gun shows as well. So it's not only the ICE, but it's also the DEA that is doing this kind of surveillance. Now, when it was discovered by the Wall Street Journal last year, the DEA came back and said, well, that was something that we were thinking about doing, but we decided that we really didn't want to do it, and we really never did that. Yeah, right. Right. We told you at the time, no, they're really doing it. They're not the only agency that's doing it as part of the dragnet surveillance, collecting information on you everywhere you go. Understand that just as we talked about Jade Helm last year, mastering the human domain, how do they master the human domain? They do it with geospatial intelligence, with activity-based intelligence, with human domain analytics, ABI, HDA. These are the components of the fastest growing part of the surveillance state geospatial intelligence they want to know where you are they want to collect your metadata it is far more important for them to collect your metadata than it is for them to record your actual activities to record your phone conversations to record your text messages they can analyze your metadata and that's what the activity-based intelligence is the human domain activity they can analyze that they can see what you do and where you do it, and they can connect you to other people, and they do it as part of a pre-crime analysis. And that should scare you to death. If you really understand the implications of this, it ought to scare you to death. That's why even the American Civil Liberties Union is concerned that they're looking at license plates at gun shows. And we have also others who say that I think the situation shows we need to establish policies for license plate readers, like any new technology, that was a CEO of a company that sells license plate technology stuff, begging for regulation to legitimize this. No, it's not legitimate. And it is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. We already have laws that address that, and they ignore that. Now, consider the fact that California, which is enacting all kinds of new gun control legislation, controlling the most minute aspects of gun ownership, Controlling ammunition purchases, registering ammunition purchases. Think about the fact that at the same time they're doing that, they are releasing restrictions on autonomous cars. Why would they be doing that? Well, because the autonomous cars are going to be their eyes upon you. It's going to also be the way that they control you with sustainability. We'll look at that in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at what happened this week. We had Governor Jerry Brown sign a bill. Why did he do that? Well, it's because you had some local areas where they were testing Google cars and they saw the increased number of accidents. They saw what was happening with Tesla cars and you had localities, especially in California, saying we're going to require that a human driver be present inside the cars. And so this has now been shut down. That local movement that was concerned about safety is being shut down now by the Federal Department of Transportation and about by the California governor, just as we've seen with concerns about GMO food and requirements for labeling by lo local uh, governments, by state governments being shut down at the federal level with the Dark Act, we now see these people stepping in at a higher level and shutting this down for the benefit of the corporations that want this. In this particular case, of course, it's Google. Google doesn't want to have human drivers at all. They're taking a different approach than Tesla. Tesla wants to take an approach of a system that uh, takes over and then hands it back off to you at a certain period of time or hands it to you if there's an emergency. Google says, no, we don't think that's a good system because you can't grab the uh, control back quickly enough. So we're going to have complete uh, self-driving cars, no steering wheels, no brakes. And now the California governor has come in and signed a bill uh, last Thursday that allows limited testing of self-driving vehicles without human backup on state roads. So you are going to be enlisted as part of this test, whether or not you like it. 
they're going to be required to travel less than 35 miles an hour, and any accidents must be reported within 10 days, yeah. Instead of maybe the two months that it took for Tesla to report the fatal crash uh, here in America, or the eight months that it took for them to report the fatal crash with autopilot in China. They say California is the first state to allow vehicles without human controls on public roads. But, of course, it's being done in Pittsburgh now as well. Not without humans. They still have humans behind the wheel. But Uber is using self-driving cars and rolling this out in a big way because it is absolutely essential to their profit. Uh, they have lost more money the first six months of this year than any tech company ever. $1.2 billion. The worst that any tech company had, the worst loss that any tech company had had was $1.4 billion by Amazon back in the year 2000. And they've done that in just about six months. Why? Because they're spending 70 to 80% of their revenue goes to their drivers. It is essential for their survival that they get the drivers out. But the government wants it because they want to track you everywhere you go. They don't want to have to rely on crude methods like going around and taking pictures of your, dry, of your license plates. They're going to use the information highways. They're going to mandate devices soon. At the end of this year, they should have the mandates in place. And in a couple of years, it'll be in all cars. Cars will be broadcasting what you're doing, who you are, where you're going to them. They will use cars as part of the Internet of Things to spy on everything that you do. And we can see this with Uber. What is the end game, of course? The end game is to limit your movement, to confine you into the cities, and some people are starting to wise up to this. In Georgia, a council, city council there has cut the cord, refusing federal sustainability funds. This is Forsyth County, Georgia. They understand what is behind this. As New American points out, HUD, DOT, and the EPA have formed a partnership for sustainable development, the express purpose of which is to merge their authorities toward a common goal of advancing what they call sustainable regions. But collectivism is what is being forced on Americans under the guise of protecting the environment and providing affordable housing to the less advantaged. That is the end game, and it is necessary for them to use cars to make that happen. Well, that's it for tonight's nightly news. Join us again tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern.